Good morning. Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Father God, we praise your mighty name this morning. We thank you for, for all the blessings of today, Lord. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for the sovereignty in our lives. Lord, we just want to honor and glorify and praise your mighty name today, Lord. I pray that we can sing loudly, that we can just focus on you, that you can just speak to us today, Lord, and we are just willing to listen. Thank you for being so awesome. It's in your son's perfect name we pray. Amen. First off this morning, as I drop my card, is we want to talk about the pastor search committee for just one second. We are asking you guys today to fill out a survey for us. If you're going to small group, these will be in your small group boxes for your leader to pass out today. If you're not going to small group on the connection point and the mission table, there's a stack of these, so please take one. We ask if you please pray about this, and you have to turn it back in. You can turn it in today. Or it can be by next Sunday. You can turn it into your small group box. You can put it in the offering box. If you are watching us online today, there's a link on our website under the pastor search committee. With a link to this, you can print it off and bring it in or send it in. There will also be a link going out on the app today to fill this out. It's only four questions. Kind of Half the page is kind of explaining it a little bit. Uh, we want you to pray about it, pray for the pastor search committee as we're searching for that person. We want your opinion about this. We want your input on this. Um, we are, there's different stages of this, obviously, and we're in the first stage, which is kind of sorting through and gathering information. And we really want your guys' input as we are sorting and gathering this information. Is that fair enough? Cool. So please do this and give it back to us so we can kind of go through it synthesize it and see kind of what the church is, what your guys' opinion of this matter is. Fair enough? Cool. Thank you. Once upon a time, there's a man, actually there's two men, and they're at a, on a safari at this wildlife preserve. And as they're kind of walking around, taking pictures, looking, they realize that they stumbled upon a lion. And this lion is very, very hungry. This lion starts chasing them. And one man runs away very quickly, and the other one's not quite as fast. He's running as fast as he can, but the lion is gaining on him quickly. The man goes, just prays. He goes, God, please let this lion become a Christian. Please let this lion become a Christian. Please, please. So the man turns around, and he sees the lion on his knees, and he thinks, yes, he heard my prayer. And he hears the lion praying, Lord, thank you for this meal that I'm about to receive. <laughs> Please stand up as we worship this morning. Hey Amen. This morning, I'm going to start us off with an oldie but a goodie hymn. And it, it's by God's design that we're singing this this morning. I'm, I'm guaranteed of that. We were at staff meeting this past Monday. And Gail was talking about the amount of times that leaning or learning has been misspelt in this church. And I got to add to that wonderful number uh, during our prayer session. So it was supposed to be leaning with, from Jesus or leaning, you know. And I put leaning instead of learning. And there was a, a campaign y'all did with a graphic that was supposed to be learning as we go, but it ended up being leaning as we go. And Gail told me about his life verse, which comes from Proverbs 3 that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and always acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. And I said, well, Pastor Gail, you won't believe this. God just told me, I could pressed on me and, and months ago and I, I put leaning on the everlasting arms. It's just been in my heart for so long that, that that's just where we're at right now. Sometimes we don't understand what's happening in life and we just need to Lean on those everlasting arms, and I hope you know it. And if so, if you can give me some, some rhythm or something this morning, just give us some energy as we get seeing, seeing about leaning on our Savior's everlasting arms.
praising God this morning, singing about his great things. this morning singing ancient words. Open hearts, we'll let the ancient world 
to do is partake in communion and I love communion it was actually the first thing me and my wife did before we even had our kiss uh, when we got married and uh, there's a much longer story to that but that was our first kiss ever and we served communion because we wanted to serve God first in our marriage and th this act of communion is is this this gift of God and we're celebrating it we're talking about it in, in such a way that hopefully will bring others to know him because God did such an amazing sacrifice he gave us his only son to forgive us when we didn't deserve to be forgiven. And how amazing is that? And he's calling us just as we are, broken, not complete, to come and, and to partake and to partake of salvation to become complete because we can't become complete by our own works. It's not by works, but by faith. And this morning, I want to sing just as I am right before we get ready for communion. Just prepare your hearts and your minds as we get ready for this act of remembrance of the sacrifice God did for us.
God, thank you so much for your gift and your sacrifice. God, thank you so much for making a way for us to come back to you, even though we're so filled with the sin of our ancestors, that you made a way for us to come back to receive you, to be back in fellowship with God, the creator of the universe. And I pray right now as we get ready for communion that you just uplift our hearts, you uplift our spirits, you help transform us into to really receiving this gift, into praising and honoring your name for this sacrifice this morning. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Praise team for preparing our hearts to honor the Lord Jesus Christ through observing the Lord's Supper. As you know, these days, this first service is televised, live stream, as they say. And so very quickly, I want to address those of you who are tuning in to this service and let you know that um, we're people of the book, as you well know, and we believe in the, the, uh, the way the Scripture teaches us as those who oversee uh, these activities, uh, particularly the, the Lord's Supper. Uh, but I want you to know that you can join us where you are. You don't have to be present here. And so those of you at home, let me encourage you to go to the kitchen, go to the pantry, get yourself a cracker, a piece of bread, something like that. Uh, if you've got juice, juice, water, that's fine because it's not the substance of the element, it's what it stands for. So you at home, uh, go get something there while I address the folks here. The Lord's Supper, as you well know, was instituted the last night of our Lord's public ministry. And there he was observing the Passover meal with his disciples and he then breaks away from the traditional model of what the bread was, what the juice was in terms of the, the lamb and, uh, and, and the redemption from the, the promised Messiah and directs attention upon himself. And in doing that, he says, as he passes the bread and it sets the stage for all of what he was doing, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. As our deacons come forward this morning and we prepare to pass these elements to you, as you hold them in your hand this morning before you partake, I want you to answer that question. What do you remember of Jesus? What, what are you remembering? What, what is, what's this mean to you personally? The intent is that we would remember not just the event of his sacrifice, we would remember who he is, the Lamb of God. As uh, Jeff so aptly pointed out, uh, we don't deserve this. Um, but yet in his grace, he gives us life. In a moment, these elements were passed here, and um, uh, this morning, um, the deacon will actually because the aisles are spread out now, and he's gonna, they're going to walk down the aisle and just, you will take the elements from the tray. No need to pass the trays, okay? And if this is your first time with this, just know that the bread is in a little cup beneath the juice cup. So take both cups from the tray as you pull them, all right? So let me distribute these to our deacons, and then we'll offer a prayer of thanks to the Lord for making this possible for us.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege, the honor of remembering what you did for us. Thank you, Jesus, for taking the penalty of our sins upon your sinless body. Now may we truly remember you and honor you as we now take this, your last supper. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On that evening, as he was gathered with his disciples, he instituted this time, and dare I say, he's still doing it. He's present here with us as he was there. He says, as he said to them to us, take, eat this bread. It represents my body broken for you. Shortly thereafter, he lifted the cup of redemption. He says to disciples, now take and drink. This represents the shedding of my blood for the remission of sin. Brian Wilson, would you thank the Lord for this? Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this time that we can just be in your house and be with each other and knowing that you are here with us. Thank you that we can um, just have communion this morning, Lord, and just um, thank you for dying for us, and loving us, and providing for us. So we ask uh, a special blessing upon this morning, upon Pastor Mark and the, the leadership here, Lord, and that you just allow us to just uh, continue to focus on you and just worship you today. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we continue in our series through the book of Genesis, we are arriving this morning at Genesis chapter 4. 
Genesis chapter 4. And while you're turning there, uh, and let me encourage you to, uh, whether you have a paper copy or a digital copy, that you leave it open to Genesis 4 as I will be unpacking that, uh, much of that chapter this morning. I'm just going to begin reading uh, in Genesis 4. So, The man was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. She also gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, and he looked despondent. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious, and why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, you won't, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? Then he said, What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed, alienated from the ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood and you have, that you have shed. If you work the ground, it will never again give you its yield. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. But Cain answered the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear, since you are banishing me today from the face of the earth, and I must hide from your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord replied to him, In that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. Then Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's pause there and let me just uh, highlight the fact that the book of Genesis basically has three major themes regarding God's relationship to us, to humanity. Those themes are generation, degeneration, and regeneration. Now we've already studied generation, that, that theme, creation of life and mankind as we looked at Genesis 1 and 2. And then we looked at the fall of man in the garden in chapter 3, which introduces us to the degeneration theme. And that theme continues now in chapter 4 with the opening pages of basically what you see as life after the fall. So I want to highlight a few things through these verses and then make application to our lives. Overall, I want us to understand two distinct things about God. If you remember nothing else, remember this. God judges sin. And he gives grace. You got that? God judges sin and he gives grace. The sermon title you may have noticed if you were watching where judgment meets grace. Well, looking back at verse 1 here, we see that Eve recognizes that God is the creator of life. When she says, I have had a male child with the Lord's help, Eve's not speaking of immaculate conception here, but she's, she's simply aware that all life originates and comes from God. All of it. Now I want you to keep that in mind because we have no reason to believe she did not teach this to her sons. All of life comes from God. Well, in verse 2, we see that Abel becomes a shepherd and Cain a farmer, supposedly like his father. Now both of these are noble professions. Uh, and they're necessary for society to exist. So it makes sense that this would be emerging in the, the, uh, uh, the expression of humanity as it, as it begins to occupy the world, the earth. Well, in verses 3 and 4, Cain and Abel present an offering from their prospective resources. And as we've read already, uh, the, the distinction between the offerings um, seems to indicate that Abel's offering of the firstborn was better than as described by Cain's offering, which was simply some of the land's produce. Produce. Now, this idea of distinction is further perpetrated or perpetuated when we read that God had regard for or accepted Abel's 
offering, but he did not have regard for or accept Cain's offering. Now, some have suggested that it was the, uh, the, the blood offering that Abel brought that was the proper offering. And, and we can kind of understand that as one considers that God would later require the shedding of blood for the atonement of sin. However, there are two things that we need to consider before coming to the conclusion that the animal sacrifice was better than the vegetable sacrifice. All right? First thing is, all these two brothers are doing is bringing an offering to God that reflects their desire to thank God for His provision. Now, where'd they learn that behavior? Well, they learned it from their parents. But nowhere does this indicate that this is to be an offering for the atonement of sin. That's, that's, that's not there. You add to this the fact that there are a number of types of offerings throughout the Old Testament of which this one is merely an offering of thanksgiving. That's what it is, an offering of thanksgiving. And then we go to the New Testament and we get further insight when we read Hebrews 11.4 which tells us that Abel's offering was accepted by God because it was given in faith. Aha! It was given in faith. And that being the question, uh, or that being the case, the question here is not one of substance, but of faith in who God is. God is worthy of our very best, the very best we have to offer. This could be then the significance of the firstborn and their fat portions. And from that, we see that Abel gave for the right reason. He gave the very best that he had. But we can also conclude that Cain did not. They were both expressing an act of worship. But one obviously was worshiping out of faith. So what was the other worshiping out of? Well, without faith, the only real choice you have left is self-gratification. Now, we know that Cain was making an offering for selfish reasons because of how he reacts when his offering is rejected. Cain was making an offering, if you please, out of a sense of religious obligation. It was an act of worship as far as he knew, but it was some obligatory thing perhaps he felt. It certainly was not to honor God's holiness. You can't honor God's holiness apart from faith. On the other hand, Abel sought to honor God, honor God by giving him the best he had to offer. Recently through Bible studies here on campus and in our small groups as well as a couple of sermons, we've, we've looked, uh, uh, I think appropriately, at the depth of Paul's charge in Romans 12 that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, which if you recall, he highlights as what? Our true worship. We miss the act of true worship when our offering to God is not from the best we have and the best we are. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice, to offer yourself of who you are, the best you have. Just be assured of this. God will not reject offerings if they are by faith, but He will reject offerings that are for self gratification. Moving on, verse 5 tells us that Cain is furious over his offering being rejected. But let's, who's he furious at? Well, who's he really ticked off at here? Well, the truth of the matter is he's mad at God, but he takes it out on Abel. He takes his anger out on the one who was innocent. Now, I, I get the privilege of stepping on toes in this posture here. And this is no minor trompled before I get to yours, all right? But we all understand this, not intellectually, but experientially. We all know what it's like to, to go after the person who is guiltless because we're angry from something else. We take our frustration out of those who have nothing to do with causing that frustration. That's unfortunate. That's part of our fallen nature, and we need to repent of that. Well, we see that God is not going to let this rest. In verses 6 and 7, he confronts Cain about his bad attitude. Now, this is a perfect opportunity for Cain to grow up and to allow God to change his heart. And God tells Cain, I'm going to kind of take a little license here. 
Hey, look, it, it's a beautiful basket of apples and gourds. But Cain, your attitude's way off here. I'm giving your brother an A. I'm flunking you in Worship 101. But here's the good news. You can retake the course. I'll give you another chance. That's what's going on here. Now Cain has a choice. He can listen to God. He can learn. He can change. He can grow up. Or he can throw a pity party and stay in his anger. He chooses the pity party. Don't miss the simple yet profound point that God asked Cain why he is upset because he wants Cain to look at the root of his problem, to think through his anger and its cause. Now just understand that if any of you present, either in this room or watching online, are furious at someone right now, God is addressing you as well. Why are you so angry? Why? Why are you upset? If you are humble enough to truly answer the question, it will cause you to think through and hopefully deal rightly with your anger. On the other hand, if you ignore God, you'll not stop long enough to consider the likelihood that your anger is based on your pride. Your pride's been wounded. And it's less somebody else's fault. It's your pride. Now, I, I truly believe this is why we, and I, I mean we, all of us, resist dealing with our anger. We can resist it. I, I would hope and pray as a follower of Christ we would, we would not resist to the point of committing sins like Cain, but we do initially resist it because we don't want to accept the fact that it's more about our pride and about our ego than it is about what is right and what is righteous. So in effect, God's question of Cain, why is furious and despondent, is a really a rhetorical question. I want you to notice in verse 7 how God answers the question with a simple spiritual truth. He says to Cain, if you do right, no worries. If you do right, you'll be accepted. You'll be accepted by me, that is God. Cain, take ownership of your anger, confess it to God, be restored to a healthy relationship with God. And also a healthy relationship with others. But, Cain, us, if you do wrong, if you stay entrenched in your pride, sin is standing right outside your door, and it wants to enslave and rule over you. But you can, you can and you must take control. You must master your anger. And if you don't, guess what? It will master you. This is basically a continuation of our study of Adam and Eve's fall into sin uh, that we just looked at in the previous chapter. And here God gives a rather interesting commentary about sin when he tells Cain, and I quote it, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And what he's doing is painting us a mental picture here of a spiritual truth. Uh, you know, it, 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 sin is like a crouching lion ready to pounce on its prey. Sin is an aggressive force. It's aggressive. And it's ready to seize you. It's ready to seize me. It's ready to seize us. I, I want you to appreciate the fact that sin is not just bad stuff. It's not something just bad that we do. Sin is a power. Sin makes us slaves. I know I wrestled with her early in my Christian walk. I know that you perhaps have or are simply asking yourself, why do I keep going back to that bad habit? Why do I keep going back to that sin? Well, we keep going back because it's our master. It's powerful. Justin John Bowden, a 27-year-old man from Minnesota, pled guilty to fifth-degree assault charges for violently losing his temper. Here's the irony. He was on his way to anger management class when he committed the crime. <laughs> According to the criminal complaint, Bowden was waiting at a bus stop when he started to harass a 59-year-old woman. Witnesses say he yelled at her over what he felt was a general lack of respect. 
When she took out her cell phone to call the police, Bowden punched her in the face. When a 63-year-old man tried to stop him, Bowden hit him with a blue folder that held his anger management homework. And the bus shows up, he hurries on the bus, off it goes. But they tracked him down because some of that homework was in that blue folder. It fell out on the ground. Name and address. <laughs> master your anger, or it will master you. Cain is at the crossroads now. He can cry out to God. He can ask God to help him in this battle against the sin of pride. Or he can stay stuck in his bitterness. He can stay stuck in his anger and his self-pity. It's very important we take note that Cain is hearing God. God is speaking to him. He's having a conversation with him. Cain hears God speak directly to him. But he leaves that encounter with God. You could say he leaves the worship service. And he makes plans to murder his brother. He decides to stay angry. And in verse 8, he asks his brother to go out into the field. Do you know what that tells us? Premeditated murder. Now let's do a heart check here. Let's do a heart check. Ask yourself, does an encounter with God change me? We anticipate and pray for and hope for each one of us to have an encounter with God when we come into this place or we come in via the camera. We pray we have an encounter with God. So the question is, if we have an encounter with God, does it truly change us? Does it change me? Am I different because I have been in worship? Am I kinder, gentler, more loving, more courageous, more passionate to tell others about Jesus, more in love with God, more in awe of God, am I more that than when I came in? Does an encounter with God change me? Please understand that it can if we let it. In verse 9, we see a similar thing to what happened in the garden when God asks um, uh, where someone is. Of course, God knows where everybody is, but he's asking. He already knows. But unlike Adam, who at least gave an honest response, Cain gets cocky. He gets cocky with God. He says, I don't know where he is. Besides, am I supposed to be his guardian? Or as the old King James puts it, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> See, what Cain is saying to God is that his brother is not his responsibility. Guess what? He is. They are. In verses 10 through 12, God lets Cain know that he's guilty of murder and that he's going to be judged harshly. I want you to notice that the judgment was that Cain would never enjoy being a farmer again. Some of you have been farmers. Uh, farmers farm because they enjoy it. It's hard work, but it's rewarding. He won't be able to have that experience again. And, and furthermore, he's going to have to be a nomadic person. He's going to have to be a wanderer. And then we see in verses 13 to 14, Cain, being the crybaby that he is, he tells God that this judgment's more than he can take. It's too much. <laughs> I'll have to wander. I have to hide from everybody lest they want to kill me for vengeance for Abel. <laughs> well, what unfolds from verse 15 and following is something surprising. At least it's surprising in how you and I would have responded. What God responds with is remarkable patience. <laughs> he literally extends grace toward Cain. No, God does not remove the judgment required. The judgment, the sin which has to be paid for. But he does protect Cain by putting a sign on or around Cain that tells others, no touchy-touchy. Now I need to put to rest here the curiosity about the mark that God put on Cain. It is as unknown as is what Jesus wrote in the sand when he challenged those who dare 
throw the first stone? We don't know. So any guess is just a guess. Of course, it doesn't keep us from wondering. The popular opinion is that the mark was some sort of blemish on his skin. Perhaps it was a tattoo. That's fashionable these days. Maybe it was a tattoo. Tattoo said, I'm Cain, and God says, leave me alone. Maybe it was just simply no touchy-touchy. I don't know. I'm going to venture out and suggest that it could have been a six-inch tall cowlick that just couldn't get down with hair gel. Just there it was. <laughs> or maybe it wasn't a mark on him, but around him. Maybe it was a miniature poodle that barked endlessly. Okay? Suffice it to say, the mark was evident enough that no one dared touch him in fear of receiving the wrath of God sevenfold. Well, as we take a careful look at the majority of Genesis 4, I want to challenge the typical conclusion people make about Cain and the outcome of God's judgment upon him. The typical or common view of Genesis 4 is that it simply contains a simple moralistic tale about good guys and bad guys. That Abel is a good guy and Cain is a bad guy. But this chapter is much more than that. It's about two realities that exist side by side throughout this story and in fact throughout the entire Bible. One of those realities is that of human sin. The other reality is that of God's grace and redemption. <laughs> and the truth is that nearly every story in the Bible boils down to those two things, sin and grace. Actually, sin and grace is the story of each of our lives. And what that means is there's hope for us. There's hope for us. There's hope because God wants to show us in His Word today that out of the mess we make of our lives, He brings glory, He brings His redemption and grace. He wants us to see very clearly where judgment meets grace. That's what Genesis 4 is for. Well, as we've already seen this morning, God responds to this reality of human sin by judging it. He issues a curse on Cain. The ground would no longer respond to Cain's farming techniques. And even worse, Cain would be a restless wanderer on the earth. He'd be sent far away from the land, or to the land of Nod. By the way, the word Nod simply means wanderer. That's, that implies for us it's a symbolic place. The land of Nod then can, as we see it that way, in, symbolize the impact of sin in our lives. Uh, the Nod is where you feel like you're cut off from God. Nod is where you get the sense that you're cut off from relationship with other humans, that you're cut off from your true self. When we sin, we become wanderers. We, we, we lose having the roots we need to live well, to live deeply. Our sin puts us under a curse. But here's the amazing good news. God does not want to leave us under a curse. He doesn't want to leave us in the land of Nod, the land of wandering. So where is Nod? Where is this land called Nod? Nod is all the times and places where we can't seem to find God. Or find ourselves. Nod's the land that seems beyond our hope and beyond redemption. It's a place where we feel weak and, and lost and, and helpless. But I want you to see that God actually pursues Cain into Nod. Let's pick up in verse 17. Cain was intimate with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain became the builder of a city, and he named the city Enoch after his son. Irad was born to Enoch. Irad fathered Mehujael. Mehujael fathered Methushael. And Methushael fathered Lamech. Lamech took two wives for himself, one named Ada and the other named Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of the nomadic herdsmen. His brother was named Jubal. He was the father of all who played the lyre and the flute. 
Zillah bore Tubal King, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Tubal King's sister was Naamah. Well, let's just let's stop there. And just say that what we just read really is nothing less than a testament to grace. <laughs> That's what that is. You see, this scene that, that we see unfold here is, is packed full of grace. Here's Cain, the one who made a mess of his life. And what's he doing? He's starting a family. Really? He's building a city and naming it after his son. In his son's honor. Now, wait a minute. Time out. Does Cain deserve this? No. He deserves death. He shed innocent blood. But God is patient. And God pursues in grace. Now, most Bible scholars talk about two kinds of grace. Common grace and saving grace. Common grace is just that. It's common to every person on this planet. God showers this common grace indiscriminately on the just and the unjust. You've heard the passage, it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay, we all, well, rain, whatever that is. I used to know what it was. But anyway, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a common grace. And this helps us understand that despite the existence of sin, there is still goodness in the world. See, the Bible teaches us that although we're sinners, we still bear the image of God's glory. And from that, we reflect God's creativity. Because what we just read here, beginning in verse 19, is being introduced to the children of Lamech, the great, great, great grandchildren of Cain. One of them, Jabal, is the father of herdsmen. He's the first rancher. His brother's named Jubal. He's the father of musical instruments. He, that's the name, that's the word we get jubilee from. Then there's Tubal Cain, who's the father of metallurgy. Tubal Cain's sister's name, Nema, a name that means lovely or beautiful. Common grace. God's creativity in this verse is pretty profound. As we're seeing these descendants of Cain, we're seeing that through these descendants of this one who murdered, premeditated murder of his own brother, we see coming through him. The beginning of music and art and tools, construction, technology, ranching, all evidence of God's common grace. And this should cause us to see how unfathomably good God is, how kind and patient He truly is. He could very easily wipe humanity off the face of the earth. Instead, He allows the arts to flourish. <laughs> but some of you are thinking, wait a minute, now I know there's another story coming where He does just that. He eventually will have to destroy all but a remnant. Because you see, they ultimately ignore the common grace becoming more and more evil. Well, along with the common grace, there's God's saving grace. In verse 13, when Cain cries out that the punishment is more than he can bear and that he would surely be killed, uh, and this, we, we want to take note again of what God does. He promises, in essence, to protect Cain. Now, this is unexpected. Again, Cain is a pampered, spoiled brat. He's rejected the counsel of the one true living God. He wants to get his own way. He murders his own brother in cold blood, and now he's asking God for protection. And God agrees. Aren't you glad you're not God? Me too. Not about you, about me. <laughs> Well, that too. <laughs> so God places a mark on Cain. It's both a sign of judgment and a sign of God's presence and grace. So basically God makes a pact with Cain. You're a mess, but no one's going to mess with you. <laughs> now what Cain should have done for his little brother, God now does for Cain. This is astounding mercy and grace. It literally comes from nowhere. Undeserved, surprising, it's free. By the way, we saw the same thing when God could have just simply killed Adam and Eve. And instead, he covers them. Now, please understand that all of this that we're reading here, the first part of Genesis up to this part in chapter 4, is a foreshadowing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel that declares that sin cannot and will not be ignored. 
that we are no better than Cain. Which means we stand under a curse as well. But here's the amazing thing. Sin moves the heart of God to not only judge and condemn, but also to save. New Testament says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our sin. That's what we were celebrating here with the Lord's Supper. Every one of our sins were placed on him. And then, listen, and then he gave us a new mark. Hmm. Ephesians 1.13. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Woohoo. That's incredibly good news. We have a mark. Call the Holy Spirit. See, when you turn from sin and, and yield your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God marks you. He seals you in His Spirit. A saving grace. We're all benefactors of common grace. But no one receives saving grace until they surrender their life to the Son of God. Have you accepted that saving grace? You are at this moment enjoying common grace, but have you received that saving grace? You can receive the saving grace of Jesus Christ by simply saying to him, not to me or anybody else, but to Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you did what the scriptures say you did. I believe you were crucified. That you bore the penalty of my sin on the cross. I believe that you did die and you were placed in a grave. But I also believe that God raised you from that grave on the third day. That you defeated death for me. And by putting my faith in you, I have saving grace. Now, I just articulated what really amounts to what we call a sinner's prayer. And whether it was those exact words or the sentiment, the attitude, one of humility. If you have expressed that to Jesus... Even as I'm speaking this morning, you have now experienced saving grace, and it will never leave you. It will never leave you. As I stated at the outset and repeated, God judges sin, and he gives grace. Understand that the believer's sin cannot separate us from God. Do I hear a hallelujah? <laughs> believer's sin cannot separate us from God, but it can and does hamper our relationship of peace and joy with him. Now, that being said... I want you to ask yourself, is there some sin in my life I'm just hanging on to that I need to ask God to forgive me for? Is there anger I need to repent of? Is there a propensity for being judgmental of others? Or is there some addiction? Understand that any one of those and all in between, that sin can enslave you. As God told Cain that he must rule over sin, we must also understand that we must rule over sin. But know this, it is absolutely impossible to do so apart from surrendering our will to God's will. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we overcome the power of sin. And that's why having him living in you, the Spirit of Christ in you, enables you to say no to sin. So this morning, as we are drawing this to a close, let's breathe a, a, a prayer of praise to God for being marked by His grace. A mark that doesn't say, I'm condemned, no touchy-touchy. <laughs> the one that says, I am a child of the King. Now, that's the mark to have right there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings on this service as we come near to an ending but that Lord your dealing with us never ends it's constant and we're very thankful for that and Father bless us now as we talk to you a bit our heart to yours may we honor you by surrendering to your will for I ask this in Jesus name Amen As we sing this song, uh, and you're
you're welcome to sing along with it. Um, uh, sing it to the Lord. And have a conversation with Him. Don't let the song get in the way of the conversation with God. That's what I'm trying to say. If you want to bow, you know it. Well, let's sing. Jeff? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take Him at His word just to rest upon His promise and to Jesus, how I trust Him, how I root Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood Jesus Jesus how I trust him how Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Let's sing Jesus, Jesus one more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. words have special meaning all of a sudden all for grace to trust him more uh, I will make a few announcements call attention to a couple of things and we'll be done but let me just say to those of you who might be here for the first time we are delighted you chose to worship with us today and encourage you to take one of the green cards in the chair back in front of you let us know how we can pray for you and any information you might request from us feel free to ask that put it in one of our offering boxes on your way out Oh, if you'd like to ask questions directly, Pastor Gail will be back here at Connection Point Table. We'll be glad to answer your questions or share with you some other ministry opportunities we have in and through our church. But in the way of uh, announcement, let me say that, that uh, we're starting an offering today. I mentioned it last week. It's uh, for helping churches in crisis. This is a state offering to help uh, the other churches throughout the state uh, that are responsibility. And even if we weren't believers, if I was addressing some club in town, I'd, I'd be saying, listen, are you a patriot or not? Do you appreciate people died to give us this freedom? Come on now. So I'm not chastising you, all right? Uh, those out yonder who aren't intended to vote, that's inconscionable. Now some of you say, you know what? I just haven't got registered. Tomorrow's the last day to do that, all right? Now, Pastor Gail and Brenda went to a meeting Thursday night uh, um, on, on our behalf, and, uh, and they came away with uh, voter registration forms. So if you haven't registered to vote, there's some back here. Pastor Gail will be glad to hand that to you and know that uh, these are filled out, taken to her, uh, Gail Griffin's office here in town. She will take them to Cochise, um, excuse me, to, to the uh, uh, county uh, building in Bisbee. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, 
by uh, the end of tomorrow so that they get registered, okay? So if you haven't registered to vote, please, there's no excuse. There it is right here. You can, you can do it today. So I hope that you'll do that. Uh, you get this kind of stuff in the mail, all right? All right? Don't go, good grief, that's thick. Go, well, good. I have some information from which I can make a wise choice. So don't run from that. Embrace it. Now, there are also some, what are those called that you brought? Voter guides that talk about each person on the ballot and where they stand on things. It's not a skewed one way or the other. It simply reports where they stand. So if you want to vote with a, I would hope, a biblical view, uh, then you need to know how they line up on those things, okay? By the way, you won't find Jesus' name on that, okay? We're not voting for Jesus, all right? But he is the one in charge, and he compels us to be a part of this. So... All right, there you go. Let me encourage you to be in prayer about the election. Be in prayer for our president and many of his staff and apparently uh, everybody in public office, it seems, now tested positive. Uh, so uh, not making light of that, pray for them, okay? Pray for them. All right, no small thing. All right, well, let's stand together and let me offer a prayer blessing on you. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, once again ordering our steps into your house today to have this encounter with you and Lord this fellowship with one another but I thank you so much for speaking to us through uh, our time of worship and and all that has occurred since we entered the doors of this place and will occur as we depart because you're in it and through it and father I pray that you'll bless every home represented here uh, with that common grace of course but most importantly with your saving grace Thank you, Lord Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen.